while on my log. There we go. We are live. We are live. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> I love that there were already people asking questions in the comments. I love to see it. And thank you so much, everybody tuning in. Um, I will run down just a few things before we get started into uh, some stuff. But yes, we have the incredible, amazing author, Sophie Anderson with us. Sophie, do you want to briefly introduce yourself and tell us what you have created in the world of middle grade literature? Books, <laughs> I write books. I've written, I've written three books. <laughs> three <laughs> Hello, beautiful Sophie. books. I write books. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all you need to know. Yeah. Yeah, and we are toasting actually. If everybody has a drink to raise your glass to Sophie for the release of the brand new Castle of Tangled Magic. Yay! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ding. <laughs> yes, um, the Castle of Tangled Magic has just been released. Um, October 1st, it came out in the UK. And if you have not already bought it, please do so. There is a Waterstones exclusive with the oh, end. You got it as well. Yeah. I, I oh, hope no, so. You're nice. No, I've got it. Oh, no, this is not a Waterstones exclusive. <laughs> Sophie doesn't know her, her own books, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that has just been released. So we are celebrating the release of The Castle of Tangled Magic. Um, so before we get into some questions and things, I do want to say that this interview will have CCs or subtitles. I will be doing them over the next couple of days. So if anybody is deaf or hard of hearing, then this interview will have CCs. I've only just finished the Laura Ellen Anderson ones, so it might take me a little while, uh, but it will happen. And yes, Tracy, I do have the Prosecco. We've got to have the Prosecco. <laughs> it's a special occasion. <laughs> um, but yes, um, I already see a lot of viewer questions. Um, I want to keep some of them just a little bit later on, um, but I will go in and out of them as I'm asking my own questions. Some fantastic questions already. Um, so a huge hello to the uh, Ternan O'Neill family in Coclair Island. Big fans, big fans, Sophie. Aww, I mean, all the <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will get to your questions as well. But um, oh, hello from Sweden. Oh my gosh, hello. Oh. Wow. Gosh, we've got some international. Oh, so I know it's Swedish. I don't oh, know. Uh, yeah, I let know us know what. Mm. <laughs> let <laughs> us know what hello is in Swedish, and we we will try. We will try it. Um, and also, it's Kirsty's birthday today. Hi, um, oh, happy, happy birthday, birthday Kirsty! <laughs> oh, she she uh, she is a, such a huge fan as well. Paula's oh. a huge fan. She loves your books. Um, Thank you. Also, CC loved Thank all of the books. I recognize her um, avatar from Twitter. Oh, and this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Claire, Claire, good evening, <laughs> Gavin, the heart stealer, Sophie. <laughs> oh. uh, yes, yeah, so we have a lot of people already uh, waiting to hear oh, your oh. amazing answers. So, uh, before all of that, though, I have some really fun ice cream. Oh, and um, we got a Swedish hello is hey, 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 hey. 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 <laughs> I think it's just, I think it's just hey, like the J is like, hey. Something like, hey. <laughs> Uh, do let us know if that's wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, so we are going to do the first uh, segment of this, which is always my favorite, and that's the icebreakers, because Sophie has no idea what I'm about to ask, apart from a couple of them. <laughs> it's going to be scary. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, first icebreaker question, and I ask all of my authors this Are you an early bird or a night owl? I oh, right, yes. Yeah. I heard this because I watched some of your videos, and I. I see, I'm rubbish at choosing. I can't decide. I think I'm an early bird for work. So um, um, after two coffees, at least, um, I, I, I do better work in the morning. But I do also like to stay up late at night. But I can't work late at night. That'll just be kind of gouching around, reading or watching something on telly. So, um, yeah, so both. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, yeah, to be fair, like I always say I'm more of a night owl because I'm always mm. up until like two or three o'clock in the yeah. morning. But then I can't sleep past 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am I feel like I kind of can be both. But... Yeah. I think when uh, we have, um, my husband and I have, have four children and two of them are quite young. So they get us up early. So um, it's, and you know, and we've had children for like 14 years now and, and they always seem to wake you up. So, so yeah, I don't really get an opportunity not to be a morning person. <laughs> so, but uh, you know, I do and... need several cafes to 
you know, before I can interact properly and focus. I love that you're a coffee person, though. That's my oh, favorite. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I like tea too, though, as well. So, you know, but coffee Please in the sorry. morning, I, I need coffee. Hundred uh, percent. Can't believe I got my kids to bed in time to watch a video about middle grade. <laughs> Fair, it's what I, mean. I do as well. <laughs> put the kids to bed and then put Disney Channel on. <laughs> uh, what is your go-to karaoke song? Or do you oh, do you karaoke? Um, no, do you know I don't. I don't. But um, and I don't think I ever have. You know, not like in public. But I'll sing at home all sorts of silly songs. So my, my daughter wants to be a chef and so she'll be cooking in the kitchen and she likes it when I put music on and, and I'll dance around singing silly songs. So um, I can't, but the last one I sang dancing around silly was, um, have you heard um, Six Shifts and Safety Belts by Cake? No, I haven't. <laughs> so silly, it's very... Shall I sing you some? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> you don't have to, you don't have to. Um, six shifts and safety belts, bucket seats have all got to go when I'm driving in my car. <laughs> it makes my baby sleep so far, and I need you here with me, not way over in the bucket seat. <laughs> wow, that makes me want to listen to it right now. You have to, you have to, it's a fun song. <laughs> How would you do sang it well. <laughs> <laughs> you should have a guitar in here. <laughs> it's catchy. I wish I could have joined in. I really wish yeah, I could have next joined time, in. Next time, we'll, we'll do. <laughs> I learn the words. Yes, do yeah, it. I... Do it. Uh, oh, Turning Wonders, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing uh, Turning wrong. Uh, Wonders, where in England you both are? I'm in Newcastle, Gateshead area. I'm, I'm in the Lake District. I'm, I'm near Penrith. Oh, I love the Lake District so, so much. <laughs> it's the first place, and I'm not from the lakes, it's the first place where my husband moved to, you know, by choice because we loved it. We moved here not knowing, not, not having jobs or anything, but we just moved here deciding, right, we're going to move here and we're going to make it work somehow because we love it. And we did. What? what an amazing place to go to as well if you are an early bird you know like getting up mm -hmm. early and that yeah. morning air and the birds and that scenery oh, yeah. the machine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or, or the or the wild sophie singing yeah. <laughs> in the distance yeah. the children screaming <laughs> <laughs> beautiful uh, can you remember what the most embarrassing thing you ever done was? Yeah, you know when I just sang on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> that was not embarrassing. That was beautiful. No, that if, was I, beautiful. if I ever watch it back, that will be the most embarrassing thing. <laughs> you know, you know what? Uh, here we have uh, Tiana saying, "I'm clapping from afar." Performance was ten out of oh. ten. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, I just tuned into karaoke. This is a new <laughs> segment. This is now going to be a new segment on yeah, this channel. Everyone do it, and then I won't seem so um, strange. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Uh, what is the best trip you've ever been on? Oh gosh, right. well I think last year, um, me and um, my family we, we haven't really been to many places as a family. My, my husband and I did some traveling before. We had children, but since we had children, we didn't really. And then last year, um, we we went on like a trip of a lifetime. We went to um, Canada and we went to Alaska. Can you see this? Uh, you see yes. This is a, 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 a dog sledding. And we went, I, I took I took everyone some summer dog sledding. And um, we just did, my, my well, my husband went to see the bears. I, but we couldn't all do that because I had the two little ones. But we did all see bears. He, like, got really close to the bears. But um, we're just, like, driving along, and there's just bears at the side of the road. And, uh, you know, I know. And um, it's just amazing. We, we just, we did Canada. We were there for, like, um, about seven weeks. And uh, so it was just amazing. It was brilliant. Oh, did that is. Did the Yukon. We did... Um, mm -hmm. Alaska, and then we went down to um, Vancouver Island as well. And so it was amazing. It was amazing. I was going to say, I think I've been doing it well now because of obviously lockdown happening. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad we did that because I'm not sure when we'll ever be able to do something like that again. Oh yeah, actually, you're kind of lucky there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like um, 
I think it was um, it was another author um, had done. Oh, was it Robin Stevens who went to Egypt at the start of the year for oh, yeah, I think the, the research for that? Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's a good job she wasn't writing yeah. it now. Mm. Lucky, very lucky. I was going to say I've been to Canada, but I haven't been to any of the places you mentioned. I went mm -hmm. to Ottawa and Toronto and oh right. I think, yeah, yeah, we didn't really do any of the big cities. We kind of we, we wanted um, to do the the rural areas and see bears. I think that was the main thing. We wanted to see bears, and we saw bears. And, considering yeah, you live in the Lake District, then it makes sense. Yeah, I think it was you know my husband in particular has a thing about bears. He's always wanted to see them, and he got to do that. And where he went in Alaska, we, we all went up to um, Alaska, but he went with one of my older children on like a, a little trip to get right up close to them and face to them, you know, like fish and salmon and stuff like that. Oh my gosh, especially, especially, that. especially since it's the girls there. Exactly, because I had finished that book, but I had never seen a bear and then I actually got to go and, and see Yanka, you know, for oh. real, it was amazing. I can't believe how close, they, they just wander at the side of the road. So you're just driving along and you stop, you know, you spot one and you can just stop and watch it. and. They don't seem bothered by you. They just carry on foraging, and it's oh, they're so beautiful, so beautiful, it's wonderful. Because oh. we don't like zoos and things like that, so we don't really see any. You know, the children haven't seen anything that's not native because I won't take them to the zoos. So it was, you know, I just like seeing things in the wild, and so we got to do that, which was wonderful. That's the only way you should be able to see them. To be fair. Um, Turn in Maggie and Frankie really enjoyed Alex's book too. They said it was so creative. Oh, yeah, my son Alec, yes, he self published a book this year. <laughs> He's brilliant. He's so talented. He's working on another one now as well at the moment. So, oh, excellent. You. I'll pass that on. He, he, he loves the fact that people have read his book. You know, that's just it's so wonderful. He works so hard. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'll have to read it now. I'll um, have to. I'll have to. Oh no, I'll buy it. I'll buy it because it's a supporting them. It's supporting oh, them. Bless you. And what is something that you hate to do? Because you're such a positive person, Sophia. So now I'm wondering, oh, like, yeah. is there something you don't like to do? Yeah, well, I don't like cleaning the toilet. That's a horrid <laughs> job, isn't it? You know? There's no yeah. I do I like to be positive about everything, but I, I find it difficult to be positive about that. It's nice when it's done, I suppose. <laughs> but you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Especially with, you know, four children as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good answer. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm trying I'm trying to get it out of you because you're just positive, like in such a, a positive influence on people as well, especially on Twitter and all the places where we can find you. Also, I link all of Sophie's socials down in the in fact it's already linked. Go follow Sophie on Twitter and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you get yeah. You'll, you'll get, if, you, if you follow me on Instagram, my two year old will send you messages. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a message. I, Did I not. About twenty or thirty people got a message and she unfollowed lots of people. She blocked lots of people. I haven't fixed oh, no. everything yet. But I spent about half an hour I was just typing sorry my two year old sent that. Sorry my two year old sent that. The joy of children. <laughs> uh, who have you been starstruck by, apart from me? Um, the, 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 the first time I was starstruck by um, was um, um, I have always loved David Almond as an author. Oh, yeah. You know, since since long before I even wanted to be an author, and um, not long after the House of Chicken Legs we published, he sent me a little private message, and he just said something like, "You know, Sophie, you, you, your book's really cool." I was like, you know. He, he said it better than that, but he just sent me a little message to say that he enjoyed my book. And, and I was like, wow, wow. So, that is a moment. That a moment. You've made it. Yeah, that was a moment that I felt, because I, 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 I admire him so much as a writer, I really do. So to know that he'd actually read my book was amazing enough. And then to, you know, go out of his way to compliment it when he didn't have to do that. You know, he didn't know me from anyone. And I, I, was, I was overwhelmed. <laughs> so that that was is so moment. nice of him. Yeah, it is. Oh. You know, a lot of people are nice, but somebody else was really lovely. I've never met Sarah Crosson. And then um, oh, yeah. after after the Carnegie, um, I was shortlisted for the Carnegie, but um, I didn't win it. And um, Sarah sent a little message, you know, just saying something nice about that. And I thought that was really sweet as well, because again, she doesn't know me. She didn't have to do that. And, you know, but generally, there's a lot of people in publishing that are just massively supportive. Even if they don't know you, they'll, you know, go out of their way to give you a little kind word. You know, and I thought that's really nice as well. 
I've noticed that, especially from a lot of middle grade authors on like, cause even like when I read acknowledgements in people's books and like you acknowledge like Michelle Harrison and yeah. you just seem to have like such a close knit. Um, Michelle, kind of... right, before I was published, before I had an agent, Michelle sent me a little trinket, you know, and I still, I think still to this day that this little trinket brought me luck and got me an agent because like a week later I had an agent, but she sent me some, I can't remember why, I think my daughter had won a little competition that um, Michelle had put up and, you know, but Michelle said something nice to me and, and some nice encouraging words and you know just it's lovely things like that that you know she didn't have to do that I was you know no nobody as far as the publishing world went you know and you know, it's yeah. nice. oh, she's really nice lady she, yeah she is amazing I mm. love Michelle Harrison so much oh I'll have to get writing, her writing is yeah brilliant absolutely brilliant she's she's awesome um, and then I kind of want to like leave the icebreakers on a really positive note. So yeah. what was the best thing to happen to you this year? The best thing to happen to you? Oh gosh, this year. Yeah. Your face just lit up there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it was really hard to pick. Because obviously this year I've, I've been nowhere. So I'm trying to think because everything's happened in my, I'm totally shielding. Um, I haven't left the house at all. So, you know, I mean, publishing and work wise it is that I've got a book out obviously it's you know every time it, it doesn't lose any of the excitement you know so to have another book out you know because as you know I was a writer for a long long time for like a decade before I got published so it was amazing you know to to have one book out and then I, I you know I, I thought this book was terminally flawed for a long time and now I'm really proud of it and and then to have a third one now in what is quite a short space of time is you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm really proud and it's really good. And also at the time, you know, the um, Castle was going to be published. A lot of books were getting pushed back because of COVID. Oh, yeah. but we carried on pressing to publish it and we did everything on time. And so I'm really proud of that. And, uh, you know, I am, I'm, I'm so happy that I got to have it because I know a lot of authors had to put it back and back. So, so, so yeah, so just having that book out on a professional front is probably a highlight of, of the year. You know, personally, I'm, moving. We moved to this house this year, so but, you know. Oh, and it's such a beautiful house. I've seen like photos on Instagram and all of that. So you, there's a lot to be proud of this year, and especially yeah. with you saying a lot of books have been pushed back, and yeah. uh, so many books did come out on October first. I think it was like a Super Thursday kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. So it's the the fact that you managed to get it out, and uh, I remember reading it on NetGalley. If, few months back and it was like the most magicalist of experiences my first ebook in such a long time yes, so, I felt so honored that you would ebook for me indeed oh yeah oh I'll, I'll ebook the next one for you just send me the send me the link I know you're not. <laughs> but, I'm so I know, excited yeah. about the next one but I can't talk about that anyway. no no I, I will we'll try and pry some information out of you at some point so keep keep tuning in guys <laughs> oh there's a really great question actually from uh, okay. Diane, and that is, um, Sophie, can you tell us a bit about which story you're re reimagining for the Mab, or is yeah. it a secret? It, well, it's not really a secret. We haven't actually decided yet. Um, um, the um, um, Eloise and Matt, who are organising it, they have been in touch, and they've asked all the authors which stories they would like to do the most and um, and they, they asked us if we could perhaps choose a couple and they're going to try to link us with the story that we want to reimagine the most but it hasn't been decided yet so I don't know so it's not really a secret it's just I don't know yet you know and I did I did tell them like one of my favorites but I did actually say that I love all of them so I'm not too fussed to be honest what I reimagine I'd like to work with any of them I love them all and you're really good at reimagining stories as well. I mean, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that soon as well. Um, but also this really nice comment as well. Grateful that Castle did come out this year. Oh, we need a sprinkling yeah. of Sophie Hope. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, but <laughs> I no one wanted me to wear a posh frock tonight, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, I could not get anything posh at the minute. Um, oh, and also, uh, could you explain what the Mab is? The first time I heard it was mm -hmm. last week. I was in the live show with PG Bell and right. he mentioned it as well and um could you tell us what it's about yeah the, the mabinogion is um it's a collection of um old celtic fairy stories old welsh fairy stories and they're actually meant to be some of the oldest folk stories in the british isles thousands and thousands of years old and they're wonderful imaginative 
um, fantasy stories. And um, do you know what? I might have. Hold on. Ooh. No, I moved it. I moved it. I had a copy there. There's several versions that have been written, but all the versions are quite old now. Um, so um, we want to kind of do it for a modern audience because, you know, they're wonderful imaginative stories. And, and I love them as a child, you know, and, and children today would love them. But a lot of the tellings that you can buy um, are either out of print or they're quite dated and use quite oldie worldy language. So we really want to bring them, um, you know, up for a modern audience. But yeah, basically they're really old Welsh folk stories and they're brilliant. Loads of the story, like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and stuff like that, takes inspiration from these stories. So, you know, they're brilliant stories. <laughs> I, I really want to read them. Mm. Uh, they sound awesome. They are. Uh, so I guess... and, and cauldrons that can, you know, bring uh, it back to life and, you know, all, all the cool stuff, you know. Boundaries between the and... worlds. And... Yeah, folk tales are like some of my favorite kind of stories, and it's probably why I love your book so much. Actually, is because you do it so well. Um, so I will get into. I mean, you don't have to hold back on this. You don't have to be modest. You can say anything you want. Um, but these are. I'm going to ask you some questions about you and like your writing and like who you are as an author. So, like, firstly, as you briefly mentioned before, and you know, something I do know is that you have been writing for quite some time before your debut in 2018. I think you wrote, uh, House was like the sixth novel you wrote. Yeah, probably more. Lost probably count, maybe more. the eighth, yeah, maybe the eighth book. Wow, so like you them. have, oh, yeah. right. So like you did have like quite a journey getting to where you are now. So can you yeah. like cast us back to before House came out? Like how did you end up getting on that path of being an author? What was your well, kind of origin story? I didn't, I didn't want to be an author because my mum's an author and I watched her sitting in like a little room typing all day and I thought that was the most boring thing in the whole world. But I didn't want to be an author and there were woods behind my house and beaches so I just wanted to be outside and then um, so I became a scientist who worked outside and I worked outside for years and I loved it and then in my 30s I had children and um, I started writing um, purely for a bit of fun for them. The very first thing that I wrote was um, a little story that starred my daughter trying to, um, because she was scared to take the stabilizers off her bike. So it was just a little story for her about a girl who was scared to take the stabilizers off her bike. And um, and that was a bit of fun and she liked it because it was about her. And so I carried on writing little stories and I must have written hundreds of just short rhyming fun stories. And then I started writing longer stories. And, um, and then I realized one day I wasn't perhaps writing them for my children anymore perhaps I was writing them for myself because I loved writing them and um I just and I just kind of got the bug if you like I just developed this passion for my writing I started writing quite grown-up stuff I started writing poetry about my feelings and you know like cathartic stuff and um, I started writing longer stories and I started I bought a couple of books about how to write and I really wanted to um, learn how to do it properly and and learn about the craft and you know, and, and I started writing books and, and, and I wrote, you know, like seven books, I think. And I did submit some of them to various places and, you know, none of them really got anywhere. And But as soon as you've written like a full length book, you start thinking, obviously you start dreaming. It would be nice to have this published, you know, so I kept doing it. But I mean, I mainly kept do it, doing it for myself. I think the idea of being published was almost like that idea of having a lottery win. It's like if I buy a lottery ticket, I might win the lottery. If I write a book, it might get published, but it probably won't, you know. And um, so I wasn't like massively disappointed by rejections. I know some people are, but I wasn't too bothered. But, you know, but anyway, but after, you know, 10 years, I, I wrote The House of Chicken Legs and and I, I knew, I don't want to sound boastful, but as soon as I wrote the first line, I kind of knew that there was something special about it. And um, and, it, and it got me my agent and it got published, I say, so, yeah. I, I mean, please do boast about it because <laughs> it's, lit, you know, I, I think I mentioned this in a video, I think when I was uh, painting the edges of the books, I mentioned House with Chicken Legs was the first middle grade I read in like 10 years. And mm -hmm. it was the one that really sparked my love for middle grade again. And it's why mm -hmm. I'm doing How to Train Your Gavin. So I owe a lot to the House with Chicken oh. Legs. I, I do want to like say that it wasn't it wasn't good at first, right? I like the first line and that stayed, but pretty much everything else changed. 
And um, I, if the book is good now, it's because of my editors. I think it wasn't so much, this is amazing, it's going to get published. It was just like an intuition of like, this is the one that's it's something's going to happen with this. And what happened with it is that it got me an agent and then it, ha it had a lot of work done. You know, it wasn't just like, this book's amazing, it's going to get published. I did about three rounds of edits with my agent before it went on submission. And then when it was... Um, uh, with my publisher was born again it had at least you know three four rounds of edits so it's not like it was amazing I just didn't you know produce this amazing book I just had a kind of cool idea I think that, that inspired people to think yeah I'll work on this with Sophie and we'll turn it into something cool you know it was sculptured into the yeah. into the masterpiece it is today <laughs> yes all things have to be sculptured nobody writes a brilliant book first time well that, maybe someone does but I, I haven't heard of them <laughs> Me neither, to be fair. Um, Claire did ask um, your other books available for purchase. Those are the books that, yeah, you couldn't get an agent for. Would you still try, like, would you still work on them or anything? Or would you? Probably not. Do probably not. I see them as like, um, like my apprenticeship, my apprenticeship. Like, uh, you know, so if you want to be a potter, you're going to make lots of pots and they're not going to be great and they're not going to be fit for sale. But that's how you learn to produce something better. And um, I mean, I, I possibly I have had the thought, I like the idea of some of them. And I have thought maybe one day I'd go back and rewrite them, but they would need a complete rewrite. So in some ways, I think maybe it's just better to move onwards. You know, I mean, they're there if I decide to one day, but probably not. You know, they are like, um, that's how I learned to write. They're my rough work. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Were most of them like were they middle grade or did you like do other age ranges as well? I did. Like I said, I, I wrote loads of picture book text first. That was my first thing um, because my children were very young. Um, then I wrote um, a couple of mini, middle grade. Then I wrote um, a YA trilogy that was really dark, and um, and then I went back to middle grade again. And I think that's my voice. I think middle grade is is where I'm at. I don't think I would go back to YA or picture books. You know, occasionally I ponder maybe a picture book or or maybe adult, but I, I don't think I could do YA for some reason. I think maybe because what I wrote in YA was so dark. I'm not sure, but you know, most I'm, I'm middle grade. I love middle grade. You know, I, I'd actually be happy staying in middle grade forever, probably. <laughs> I would be happy for you to do that as well. Yeah, indeed, I think so. That would be the most likely course of instances I will stay in middle grade. I, Diane did say uh, I would love to. <laughs> say you do a YA though Sophie mm -hmm. I feel like we would just love anything that you produce really which is the Sophie Anderson fan club <laughs> I, mean, I never say never but it's not it's not scheduled it's not in my mind at the moment but you know I would like yeah. to live a long time so in, you know maybe <laughs> but you know my next few ideas yep. are definitely middle grade I think <sighs> yes I'm happy with that <laughs> Claire said you are a phenomenal writer Sophie and how you brought the house of chicken legs to life was just beautiful and once I realised the twist with Maranka, oh God, it's all my heart. The twist took me by surprise. That was I was I didn't plan the book at all, and I was typing, and and that scene with the twist came up, and I honestly I dropped my laptop, and I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> and it was so it just, weird because it all made sense as well. I didn't know it until I wrote it, and then it all made sense. You know, I'm a I'm a proper believer, and I think subconsciously our minds know what a good story is, and I think subconsciously I had planned it maybe I don't know but yeah it was a surprise to me too that bit <laughs> well that's uh I think Laura did talk about that uh Laura Ellen Anderson did mention that you know um sometimes the world just falls into a place and that's mm. when you know that it's a story that you're gonna love and yeah. you're gonna kind of bring to life as a one that does come naturally to you so I love it. I think that's, I think you're right. It, it does, it does come to you. I mean, not that I can speak because I haven't, you know, written in a middle grade book or anything, but I, I feel you. I feel you. You just, oh, you just know what's right. Um, what does a typical day in the life of uh, Sophie Anderson look like these days? I know with the whole situation with everything going on in the world, but like, what's a good writing day look like for you? A good but like everyone else, I'm kind of, I'm locked down. So most of my days are at home with my husband and our children at the moment. So there's a lot of um, family stuff. But um, I do try to write every day um, in some way, depending what stage of the writing process you're at. Writing can obviously be um, a different thing. It can, writing can actually be just walking around thinking about, you know, your world and your characters. Writing can be actual writing. You know, obviously it can be editing. 
Um, I've given up. I used to measure a good writing day in terms of word count, but I've, I've given up that now. I think that's a, a horrible thing to do to yourself. And I just think now I think a good writing day is when the story that I'm working on, when I move forwards with it in some way, you know, and that doesn't it doesn't have to be any words that could just be a realization of where it's going or a realization of something that's not working. Um, so I just think every day I want the story to grow or just to become clearer, not necessarily to become bigger even, but just to become clearer and to form itself better. So I do, I like to do something every day, you know, and um, I was saying to you before we started, it wasn't nice. I've been working quite hard this week trying to get a lot of work out down, but um, I, I can work hard in short, you know, sprints, but then I'll need a break, you know, to, to, to refill my creative well. And, uh, you know, a lot of writing is just thinking, you know, I think you, you have to factor in thinking time, you know, as well. You can't just sit and write. Well, I can't. I have to think. Too. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah, because I can only imagine the amount of I mean, do you plan a lot? Because like with you saying that you're thinking, I can imagine it just being almost like a mess or kind of hard to sift through all of that. Yeah. in your head and trying to get it down onto paper like would you would have to plan a lot then if you're doing a lot of thinking as well yeah I'm not I've never been very good at planning I I, I wish I was better and each book the house with chicken eggs I didn't plan a, a thing I just sat down and started writing and um and then the girl who speaks bear I thought I'm gonna plan it better and then that will mean I won't have to edit as much but it didn't work like that I wrote a plan and the book didn't follow the plan and then with Castle again, I thought, right, I'm going to plan this and the plan didn't work. And I think this the fourth one now I'm working on now, I've actually done the best planning I've done. So I think I'm getting better at planning now. But that remains to be seen because the book may still be <laughs> off course, you know. But um, So I'm not the best at planning. But I, you, you do have to. I think I kind of perhaps plan as I go along. So I write a bit and then stop and think. And, you know, I don't, yeah. I have a lot of notebooks down here in my drawers. I, ha I have so many notebooks that I can't read what I've written in them. I scribble and I draw maps and 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 make a mess. And then at some point, I'm, I I I, have, I start writing properly, you know. Oh, I was going to say I would love to get my hands on those notebooks, especially you wouldn't make for sense the next. They're just full of scribble. <laughs> I would I would try to decipher it. I would I would do my well, every Jordan time. Say, is it, how can you read your writing, Mum? I say I can't sometimes. I what have I written? <laughs> Kids are incredible. Don't they like give you feedback as well when you're they reading do. the story to them? They yeah, do. they must help Brilliant. so much with your writing. They and they give me ideas that end up in my books as well. So, you know. <gasps> And my husband does too. They are. They're all brilliant. You know, at the moment they're helping me with this new one now at the minute and giving me ideas and um quite a few of the things in Castle, uh, you know, are their ideas, you know, blatantly stolen from them. So and they do, <laughs> anyway. They're honest. You yeah oh I it sounds like they, they, they'll wander off if they're bored you can't you know they might say yeah that's great mom but you know if they're wandering off reading another book and you kind of know it's not working <laughs> <laughs> that's the best kind of sounding board though kind of like honest genuine opinion you know they're not going to kind of beat around the bush they're just going to give mm -hmm. it to you straight totally, like totally. yeah they're good I'll I love this. Did you choose the middle grade age group or did it choose you? I feel like yeah. it probably just chose you. It, I think it, was it did, age. yeah. I think yeah. so, because I experimented with a lot of stuff before I settled on it. So I think it chose me. I think naturally perhaps that's my mental age. Is, is that mental age? I don't, you know. Yeah. I, but yeah, I, I love I love that. Um, like you, I love those books. I think, you know, perhaps I should have realised that and started, you know, writing middle grade straight away because I have always loved middle grade books. You know, and um, so perhaps I should have realised that was my calling. You know, but it did. It chose me. It's um, yeah. Well, I'm glad oh, it happened the way it did because we might not have gotten the house with chicken legs the way it is. You know, like if anything had have been different, like in your writing journey, or like, well, in fact, any of the books might not have turned out the way they had if it had yeah. been different. So I'm so glad, and I mean. I can't speak it for you, but I'm I'm grateful. An adult book, you know, because I have um I've toyed with the idea of doing something chicken legs e in a in an adult field, you know. I'm not sure I will now, but it but it could be it would be a different book, but there is scope for obviously um that imagery as an adult book, you know, a lot darker. But you know, I've done it middle grade now. I like it middle grade. <laughs> yeah, it's never leave it. 
Uh, Elise said, "Me and my nephew read your books for night time," and oh, I just wanted I wanted to highlight that because it's I love quite. That's, good, that's what I wanted to write, you know, because because I'm a mum, obviously, and I do bedtime stories, and you know, my favourite books are books that I can read that I can get something out of, and all my children can get something out of, and they're all very different individuals, and you know, there's a, loads of amazing middle grey, but honestly, that there, there's there's quite a small amount that you can read to, you know, children with as varied ages of mine and everyone like it. So, you know, but that's kind of what I was aiming for. I wanted to produce a book that could be a bedtime story that, you know, the parents would like and the children would like. And, you know, so, so that's, that's, that's my heart. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> it's what you wanted to do and you did it. <laughs> um, so I guess that brings us to your first book, which was The House with Chicken Legs. And oh, honestly, I love it so much. Yes, you. Can I show you my Gav exclusive edition? Oh, with the purple. That's yeah. my author girl. One, one day I might have some sprayed edges. We need to get Usborne on it. We will get Usborne on it. I will pester the life out of them. But also the American cover as well. Yeah, um, I've got mine too. Mm -hmm. uh, we match, we twins. <laughs> this is by, I have to say, this is by um, the, the covers by Chris Sickles, who works for Red Nose Studio, and he is a genius, an absolute genius, and, and a brilliant bloke as well. I well, we could start off with a kind of question with the illustrations and stuff because very early on we did have um, from Frankie, age five in Ireland. I would also like to say hi. Wonders about mm -hmm. whether you help with the pictures in the book, so. Kind of, I, do you want to talk about the illustrations before I talk about my questions then? I kind of... I really say, yeah, basically, I don't really help with the illustrations because um, because the illustrator and the, the designers at Usborne, it's like they're the experts. And so really, I try to leave them to it because they, they're just better than me. I, that's not my expertise and that's their expertise. And thankfully, I've always been massively happy with everything that they've been doing. So um, I kind of leave them to it. And the only they do send me roughs and they ask for feedback but the only the only things that i ever pull up will just be sort of um like little details to do with um it matching the text but that's it so you know so i might say like at one point in um castle um i said oh in this scene she should be wearing her helmet you know and um so i'll just pick out little things to do with continuity and in all honesty sometimes it's the text that changes and sometimes it's the image that changes which some um, people might not realise because um, you you have to you know if an image is working better a certain way like for example there's there's an image of um, Koshka who's a cat um, lying down and I think originally in the text she was standing up but the image of her lying down was a lot stronger so we just kind of I just kind of moved around at what point she stood up just so we could have that image that worked so well you know and there's a I couple of things that image. Yeah. I, on the, uh, the one with the tree yeah is that, yeah yeah I yeah because she was lying down and then she stood up and we just kind of changed at the point at which she stood up so that we could have that image in that place and it matched the text so i will and so we'll discuss how it matches the text there's another scene with ollie dangling from the tree that also i changed the text to match the image rather than the other way around but there are other images where they change the image to match the text but um so i i will help with with that because i have the the text in my head more but um other than that i just leave them to it like entirely my editor chooses which scenes get um illustrated he writes the illustration brief the illustrator gets on with it um there's um, a designer at Osborne called Catherine Millertop and she does um basically she uh, liaises with the illustrator and tells the illustrator what she wants and what she thinks is working because she has a very good idea of how it works in a book you know and so I kind of leave them to it basically and, and, and nod and smile and say yeah that's great. <laughs> well fortunately Osborne have been fantastic they are a fantastic they are uh, publisher amazing. I mean yeah. when you see the covers of the books as well you know that you're in good hands. Absolutely yeah. they're a brilliant brilliant publisher Osborne covers are great you know I, I would be foolish to say you know I want it this way or that way because they're experts you know at all of that stuff so I, you know I leave them to it. Yeah. Oh, I love them so much. Um, so my first official question also ties in with a viewer question, and that is the inspiration behind the house with chicken legs and why Russian folklore? Because also Maggie, age seven, asked um, which Russian fairy tales inspired your own writing. So I guess that ties in because your books are kind of Russian uh, fairy tale inspired. So yeah. 
what's what's this story? I mean, you're probably sick of answering this question, but oh, it's, I fine. Ask it. it's, it's my grandmother. <laughs> my, my grandmother hails from that region of the world. She she's from a place called Prussia, actually. That um, uh, it's the, the town that she was born in is now actually in Poland, and the town that her parents were from is now actually in Russia because Prussia, um, it it it, it is not there anymore because of the war. But, but basically, she was from Eastern Europe. She came over after the war, and um, and uh, she didn't bring anything with her, like lots of people. She lost it all in the war, but she had those stories of Eastern Europe that were really important to her, and the music and the recipe. So I spend a lot of time with her, and she cooked me food from you know when she grew up, and tell me the stories of when she grew up, and play me the music, and and you know. So I grew up with these things, and they were really important to me. So. I think um, quite often those, you know, obviously what happens to you when you're young and the stories you hear when you're young, they really stay with you. And they also feel like part of my heritage because, you know, because um, they're from my, my grandmother and it was so important to her. And you know, especially because she, she had lost, you know, her family and, and, and the things, you know, that she owned, you know, but she held on to these things dearly. And so she gave me my love of them. So, um like I said, I started writing when I had children. So these were stories then that I started telling my children because my grandmother had told them to me. So I think naturally they started creeping into my writing then, you know, and um, in particular, um, obviously there's um, um, Baba Yaga in this book is um, a Russian folklore character. I didn't make up Baba Yaga. I, I borrowed her from Russian folklore. And um, uh, because I... I, I knew I wanted to use that character, so I researched her massively, and I could actually talk about her for about three hours. So I'll, I'll stop now. But basically, she's a fascinating character, and um, you should all research her. She's brilliant. And and basically, I wanted to show um, a kind of kinder side to her because that side does exist in in Russian folklore, and um, it's not always portrayed. She's quite often portrayed as the evil fairy tale witch. And whereas she she can be, but there is also a good side to her as well. Her origins are actually rooted in like she's probably like um like an ancient pagan goddess and stuff, and it's, it's just fascinating. So so yeah, so I kind of I wanted to to use her in my book, so I borrowed her and I created my own Baba. Yeah, I love that because <laughs> I remember when I went into Waterstones when it was Book of the Month. And mm. it was the Baba Yaga side of it that made me want to pick it up because I had heard um, mm. the Russian fairy tale of it, but I didn't realize that she could be a good, a a good, good character. character. Yeah. yeah. So I love, no, I love oh, that. She, she's, oh, she's a, she's a pivotal character in, in all the fairy tale. When she appears, you don't know if she's going to, quite often she'll threaten to eat the main character because she has this cannibalistic side but you know quite often you know she, she'll also help the main character even in like the most famous story about her which is Vasiliza where the girl goes to her house and Baba Yaga gives her all these trials and stuff and Baba Yaga gives her this glowing skull which ultimately burns her stepmother who's like the real evil character so she enables her to escape you know her um bad situation even though she's been sent there and, and threatened to be eaten and stuff so you know she's she's a fascinating character she's so good she's she's, she's cool oh interesting i have to read that all of, all of the imagery is you know is, is about she lives on the edge you know between life and death and stuff so so much in the house of chicken legs is inspired by her but also inspired i researched you know like ancient pagan Slavic beliefs and stuff and loads of the imagery in the book about death about the black mountains and and, and the, the, the glassy mountains and the black um, ocean a lot of those things are from my uh, ancient rituals that I read about and you know so I, I yeah a lot of research <laughs> well, no, you'd be amazed how much you have to research like a middle grade fantasy book I was talking to Ross Montgomery about it earlier. The, uh, the internet searches I've put in, in my thing this week. <laughs> I can imagine, like, the police raiding your your uh, laptop, like, what? <laughs> they did but they'd be confused as you like. <laughs> Why is she researching? <laughs> See, I want you to say, up. Yeah, I want you to tell us. Spoiler, spoiler. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> Uh, well i'll ask you again in an hour uh, yeah. <laughs> also ross montgomery yes i love him he wrote the midnight guardians which is coming out yeah. next month yes i have a copy here <laughs> if you, do you have your copy 
<laughs> yeah, oh, the final cup here is it is it, this is beautiful, oh. but the final cup is even more beautiful, isn't it? it I'm it tipping is, it. Yeah. For, I know you're not allowed to say if you know, but I'm tipping it for book of the month. Um, I think. Yeah. It might be. I we'll think. I think. Yeah, it's definitely a front runner, just of how magical and wonderful it is. But yeah, Christmas sorry, I Christmas day, Christmas day. Yeah, Christmas perfect day. for the November time. Yeah, which yeah. is weird because I, I I read it back in it might be May or June when I read it. Mm. But it still put me in the mood for for yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it was this day, September. They moved it back. It's another one that got moved back, isn't it? But, yeah, we would have already had it by now. In yeah. final I think format. it'd be good at Christmas now. I think, you know, it's, it, it's, it's probably good that's a Christmas one. So, good book. Everyone should look out for this one. Ross's book. Don't. don't worry, I will annoy everybody to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I annoy everyone anyway, so it's all good. Uh, can you remember the very first day you sat down and started to write The House of Chicken Eggs? As you said, you had the first line and it was like, that was the first line you knew and it inspired you. and. That was a special line to you, but like, can you remember the first day where you oh, had yeah. the idea and you started like? Um, I'd been writing. Um, I'd been writing a series. I had in my head I was going to write a series of five books, um, and I'd written three of them, and um, and I finished the third one the night before. And before I went to bed, I was like, I'm going to write start the fourth one tomorrow. And then I got up and I thought, Do you know what, <laughs> I can't be bothered with books anymore. I'm kind of perhaps either they're not really getting me anywhere either, you know. So I'm going to start something else. And like I said to you, I, I wasn't a big fan. I was, didn't plan at all then. I remember just sitting down at the table that we had. This is in our old house. And it was a very cute little cottage. And I remember the window and the sun shining through the window. And I just started typing. I just I thought, I'm going to write a Baba Yaga thing. Um, but obviously, it's going to be middle grade. So um, middle grade, you need a middle grade age protagonist. So I can't actually have Baba Yaga as the main protagonist. So I'll just put a young girl in her house. And so I just thought, right, I'm a young girl. My books are all written first person, so I just become that young girl. So I'm just like, right, I'm going to be a young girl in Baby Yaga's house. So I just wrote down, my house has chicken legs. And that was it. And that's like I say, at that point, I thought, this is this is going to be good. <laughs> you know? and it was a long time. But at that first line, I thought, yeah, you know, this could be cool. This could be good, you know. And, you know, and it was. It was immense fun to write. It was cool. So, you know, years ago now, that was. A lot happened since yeah. then. <laughs> It was a pivotal day. It was, um, yeah. It got me my agent, which is the, the, the big deal is getting an agent, definitely. Yeah, getting a publisher is obviously amazing, but, you know, an agent is, is awesome. Oh, gosh. I could only imagine. I would, I mean, I'm not really writing anything at the moment, but I would love to do that at some point. I think it would be incredible. I just love storytelling and just, like, what yeah. you do, and it's just all... Oh, I, yeah, <laughs> sorry. I, I it makes a big difference because, like I said, I was writing yeah. for 10 years and I wasn't getting any feedback from anyone. So I don't think, I, obviously, I was improving a little bit in those 10 years, but the amount that I approved, I improved from the point I had an agent and actually had some professional feedback was massive. I've learned more in the last few years working with Rebecca, um, um, Gemma is my agent, and Rebecca, my editor, and just working with professionals who know what they're doing. I've learned million times more in these few years than obviously I learned in those 10 years of, of kind of you know pootling along by myself you know so a very huge shout out to Rebecca and Gemma Gemma yeah. Cooper who uh Gemma yeah, yeah oh, I really love her brilliant, brilliant brilliant lady yeah. she can spot talent she she can spot she's talent. got some awesome authors she has Jessica Townsend Robin Stevens you know, B.B. Alston, he's got a book coming out in January. Everyone needs to buy that. Oh, I been, um, yeah, I did too. And I'm waiting still. <laughs> Same. I've seen a few landing. I'm I'm not jealous at all. Same. Oh, we will get it. We will get it. We'll get everybody to get it. <laughs> uh, Dion said uh, there must be so many stories about death and rituals out there from different cultures that could be written about in middle grade yeah. stories. House has set a high bar. Yeah. It'd be like, nice to have more books, though. It'd be nice to have. There's a brilliant book, um, an, an adult book, a non-fiction book by a lady called Caitlin Doherty. It's called mm -hmm. From Here to Eternity. And she's actually, she's a lady who works in a funeral parlour. She she does, you know, she, she deals with the dead. And she's fascinated by the dead, by dead bodies in particular, and what different cultures do with them. And it's a fascinating book. She kind of discusses you know, death rituals all around the world and different beliefs and just how we treat the dead bodies as well. And it's fascinating. And it's not um, middle grade reading, 
but I have read it and thought, you know, there are so many stories, you know, they could be middle grade stories that come from it. And, you know, Caitlin's kind of thing is that we need to talk about death more because as well as working with dead bodies, she works with grieving people. And um, her kind of thing is that, you know, if people were prepared better for death, then it wouldn't be so difficult at the point, you know, she's trying to help them through grief if people prepared a bit better, you know, so it's, um, it's something we need to talk about more. We need to normalise talking about it, you know, yeah. and it can be my, my main aim with, with this was to make a book about death that was comforting, that wasn't scary, you know, which is why Baba changed so much. I didn't want scary Baba because I didn't want anything scary in the book. I didn't want zombies. I didn't want scary. I didn't want it to be sad, you know, mm -hmm. even I know it is sad, obviously, because it's about death, but I really didn't want it to be overly sad. I wanted it to be a comforting book about death. You know, that was my aim. Yeah, so. <laughs> I still, I was still had my heart torn in two. Just yeah. you know. <laughs> hey, there are <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't it's have to be sad about death, but I hope that there's, I hope it's balanced with the hope, you know. And, yeah. And the making the most of your life and the celebrating life, you know. It was, I needed to write it. In the couple of years before I wrote it, there were a lot of deaths in my family. And um, you know, I said about the YA that I wrote, in particular, yeah. my younger brother died and I was in a dark place and I wrote this dark YA and it was very dark and I had a lot of dark feelings and a lot of grief in a, in a not a healthy way. And I think I was just coming out of it when I wrote The House of Chicken Eggs and I really wanted, it was my moving on book, I wanted it to be a book about, I was grieving a lot of people, but I wanted it yeah I just wanted it to be a comfort I wanted it to be a moving on book and it, and it was I think and it's been really moving how some people have reacted to it in that way you know I've had people dm me saying that they, they've read extracts at like loved ones funerals they've read the death journey words uh -huh. at, people, you know, at people's funerals and you know people just saying that it really comforted them you know after after you know like a loved one's death and to me that's I, I feel really honored that it's part of that because that's what it was for me it was a book to help me move on from from grief you know yeah oh that makes it even more i guess um poignant because mm -hmm. you know as you said you've been through so much and um just kind of how you're kind of in channeling that in the house with chicken legs i mean just like knowing that now and thinking back on how i reacted when i read it it does feel a bit more personal and it feels more um like something that it's like, it is a middle grade, as you said, but I feel like anybody could read it, adult, child, and still, because it's it's a theme, it's a theme yeah. that a lot of people kind of identify with. And actually you touched on a lot of things that um, I was gonna ask about, but it, um, you perfectly summed it, summed it all up because um, just like without, you know, any spoilers or anything, but like how it, it was important to you, wasn't it? To kind of have this down and for a children's book to have the morals of, um, and the le lessons that Marinka learns about mm -hmm. death and moving on and grief and all of that and how to process it. So that must have been quite important for you. Absolutely, yeah, it was. And it was um, quite a few people who worked on the book, you know, um, kind of had, had lost someone as well, which was like, I remember when I first met the Usborne team, one of the Usborne team said that someone she loved had just died. And so when she read the book, she was crying, but she also was comforted by it. And, my American editor, the same thing happened. She said they were crying in a coffee shop when they read it. And, oh. and you know, but you know, but in amongst all that crying, you know, they there is this like they all felt happy that they'd read it and it had comforted them and stuff. And like, you know, that 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 was what I was aiming for. And, you know, because obviously you're gonna be sad, you know, with with the grief, but I wanted it, you know, ultimately to be the moving on, you know, not dwelling, you know. So Yeah. yeah. I feel <laughs> And, and I think, you know, it's a lot of, like, out of the three, um, it, it's still quite a few people say that's their favourite. And I appreciate it because it, you know, um, just that theme of death is obviously universal. And it's, um, it's you know, it, it's a big thing. It's a big thing that happens in our lives, you know, when we lose loved ones or thinking about our own death, you know. And, and so it's, um, yeah, it's something that a lot of people connected with, basically. That's why it was hard to follow. <laughs> that's why book <laughs> there for a long time I thought how can I follow chicken legs because everyone loved chicken legs because it was about death you know and I thought you know death is so universal but I, I don't want to write about death anymore I've moved on now I want to write fun and adventure and are people going to love that as much you know and 
Yeah, I totally, no, I totally get that. Um, and I mean, actually, that would have been a great way of segmenting, like, well, segueing into a girl who speaks fair, but I still have, I still have a question for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I totally uh, relate to that. Like, I really want to, like, reread The House with Chicken Legs now that I've, like, lost a family pet. And I just feel like even it doesn't matter if it's like a, a human or an animal, I feel like the house with chicken legs can be something that would help a lot of people. And it's something that I th I feel like house with chicken legs deserved way more recognition and it, it oh, deserves all of the awards. It did well. <laughs> I wanted to get more recognition. I wanted to like yeah. take over the world. <laughs> and Claire said, I'm probably older than you both at the age of 42. No, I'm older, I'm older than you. You're a baby. <laughs> Uh, but the House of Chicken Eggs is a massively important read and can help those dealing with loss so so much. And that's why I feel like I I really want to reread it this week. Uh, just I feel like it would it would help me. Um, but I also wanted to ask before I get into it. I, I want to get back to the positivity because I'm a positive person. You're a positive person. You became a Waterstones Children's Book of the Month, which is a huge deal, and you got shortlisted for Waterstones Book Prize. So, like, do you remember when you were told all of these incredible things? Like, how did yeah, how did that I happen? Did. Yeah, I what did. like, how did it mean to you? And like, did you celebrate? Like, what were all the positive things that came it from was, publishing your first I book? I found out about what well, the Watson's Book of the Month. Um, to be because I because it was my debut, and I, I wasn't massively knowledgeable about the scene. I I I didn't really at first quite understand how big a deal it was. But I remember my um, editor Rebecca phoned me to tell me, and she was in Boulogne, the big children's book fair. And she phoned me from Boulogne and she was so excited. She was squealing down the phone, you're, you're Watson's Book of the Month, you know. And so her excitement was kind of the first clue that this was a big deal. You know, and then I talked to my agent about it and she told me the kind of what it meant in terms of, you know, all the Watson's book sellers are going to be selling your book, hand selling your book, pushing your book. And so and she discussed what that meant in terms of sales, you know, and obviously because she's about the money. And, uh, and so, like, <laughs> yeah, it's quite a big deal then, isn't it? You know, that's cool. You know, but I think it really it really hit me when I started seeing the displays, you know, and like hundreds of bookstores across the country creating these amazing house with chicken legs displays. And um oh it was just like wow, it's like this this is actually like a really big deal, isn't it? You know, and, and um yeah, and like just having that army of passionate Watson's booksellers, you know, pushing your book and selling your book, it does it does amazing things for sales. There's no way it would have sold as much. And without it being Watson's book of the month, but also in terms of the prestige and the recognition, and you know, it just everything snowballs, and it's not it's not just for that book. It, it, it's such a big boost to a debut author's career. You know, I think I'm I'm still riding that wave. If I hadn't been, if the House of Chicken Legs hadn't been Donna's book of the month, you know, I think everything would be different. You know, and you know, yeah, everything because it, it does launch a career. It's a whole career launching thing. It's not just about the one book. It launches you as an author, you know. And then, like you say, that being followed by being up for the Watson's Prize, and and that year, Chicken Eggs was up for a lot of prizes. It didn't actually win many, but it was up shortlisted for loads. And and just you know, so that that it, just it being seen everywhere is you know, it's amazing. It was an amazing year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I get yeah I mean water songs are fantastic at picking a book of, of the month as well like oh, I have yeah. so much confidence in oh, what they pay for it so as mm -hmm. you said like, like actually hand selling the books like I totally I, I get it because like mm -hmm. I, I do that a lot myself but I have so much confidence in what they choose and then I read it and then I'm like oh my god like yes yes this is this is I what the world needs yeah you know I always like, I'm, I'm proper into it now I always try to predict it and I always buy it, and you know, they're, they're all excellent books that they pick. Yeah. It's a fun game. They, every often they, 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 they hoodwink me, you know, like like this month with um, a kind of spark because it wasn't published this month. They did this with um, um, Carly's one, the dog one. I Cosmo. I, yeah, I Cosmo. That wasn't published that month either. So every so often they'll, they'll pick one that's not published that month. And I, I, I always try to pick one out of the ones I know are published in that month. I'm like, oh, they got me. <laughs> I do the same thing. How did we not know? We're going to have to start collaborating on this because yeah, I try yeah. best as well. But it was an excellent choice this month. You know, obviously, um, it, it kind of sparked brilliant, brilliant. So Fantastic. they do. They always pick good books. They always pick good books. Yeah, they do. Uh, oh, <laughs> I assume Sophie is drinking mead. <laughs> <laughs> 
I actually I have rum the same thing. <laughs> but you know, I did wait because I nearly did have mead. I had a look in the cupboard. We haven't got lots in the cupboard, but we still have some Lindisfarne mead that I bought in Lindisfarne and, and haven't drunk. <laughs> so it was kind of a choice. It's like, shall I have I'm drinking the rum I normally put in fruitcake? It was um, shall I have my fruitcake rum or the mead? Well, there was a strange, oh, wow. it was a gin, but I, I don't do gin, so I left that in the cupboard. I'm not sure why it's in the cupboard, to be honest. <laughs> I think, um, especially with the mead reference as well, because so many people loved your video for Believeathon and the announcement videos. <laughs> oh, I meant, to bring the, I meant to bring the thing down. It's up in my daughter's room. My daughter has the mirror with you um, <laughs> in her bedroom. <laughs> I love that. She's but she was saying she's fourteen now, and um, she, one, one night she was feeling a bit sorry for herself, and I said, "Why don't you watch a nice Disney movie?" And she said, "Oh, I'm too old for Disney movies." Now. I said, yeah, "Don't be silly." I said, "Think of Gavin." <laughs> I am a model. <laughs> and, you know, and you did. You actually inspired her. She said, "Yes, if Gavin can still like Disney, I can still like Disney." So she watched Frozen or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then she I, has that mirror with you in her bedroom to remind her that you can, you know, you can always be young at heart, and you can. You know, she doesn't especially with middle school. Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of people I've known, like just like kind of breaking into the booktube thing, a lot of people mm -hmm. don't talk about middle grade because I think they're too old for it. And I, I feel like that people shouldn't have that mindset. But also, it's hi so Nikki, <laughs> if you're watching, hi Nikki. <laughs> I nearly brought it now, but it's so long. She'll she'll be up getting ready for bed now. But um, yeah, she'll watch it later. But no, I think you know, like middle grade children's book, and I understand why they're called children's books, but they're really everyone books, aren't they? Yeah. Like adult books are just for adults. But children's books are for everyone. So perhaps we should call it adult books and everyone books. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, we should. We should. Let's start doing that. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I wish I had brought this in a little bit earlier because you segued into this so phenomenally when you were speaking about transitioning from The House with Chicken Legs to your next incredible yeah. novel, The Girl Who Speaks Bear, which That's I have right. my, my blue. Oh, you made it blue as well. Beautiful. I, I love Catherine's Catherine's art. Oh, Kath yes, me too, mm. me too. And the inside as well is phenomenal. Um, and yeah. also, and, uh, I will I will get a, a couple more copies of your book and I will paint the edges myself and send you them. They can oh, be my, that would be so they, will, cool. they will be my Gav special editions. I love it when oh, they, they, they black the pages and the text is in white. Yeah. That's an incredible it's one. That has the right, yeah. With the stars. Yeah, just kind of like. Oh. Yeah, oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm so lucky. So lucky. You are. <laughs> yeah. We don't all get illustrations, do we? Middle graders don't always get illustrations. I was so happy, you know, that yeah. I did. I'm, I'm sure at one point with chicken legs, they were just talking about just chapter header ones. And then all of a sudden, there were more and more. I was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, actually, PG, PG Bell was talking about that as well, about the train to impossible places, which came out mm. around about the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we, we got him. Um, yeah, he is. Yeah, he's up. To, me and him went to, because um, I met him, all the new Usborne authors get like a little Usborne training. So um, he was like in my little group, you know, my little debut group. So, and we share our agent as well. He's with Gemma too. So, and he's Welsh. So I have quite a lot in common with um, PG Bell, actually. He's brilliant. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Come such a long way since the debut days. So the girl who speaks bear. Then shall we talk about how this idea came about? How you mm. managed to write the girl who speaks bear following the house with chicken legs? Yeah, it was terrifying because um because chicken legs had done so well. So I did. I convinced myself that nothing was was going to be as as even if it was a good book, I thought it won't be as popular because I was convinced that chicken legs was only popular because of the death theme being universal, like we were saying. And also it had the Watson's Book of the Month push, which I knew I wouldn't get again because they they very rarely give that to you again. I'd have that, you know, I don't actually deserve it again. You, you have it once and that's the way it should be, really. So I was kind you of preparing myself. I don't? You deserve it. You deserve all the love. I, I, they need to spread it round, that's fine, you know. But, um, but anyway, for those reasons, I kind of, I prepared myself for it not, been a success which probably wasn't oh, the most positive way to think about it but um but on top of that i um it was choosing the idea as well because um i'd, I'd signed a two-book contract but i hadn't really thought very much about 
what it was going to be, you know. And then I did actually have one idea for book two and my agent didn't like it. So I, I loved it. I was convinced it was the best thing in the world. <laughs> she didn't like it. She, oh, went, just oh, she was right. No, she's always right, which is really weird, you know. And she's brilliant because you know what she says? She says, I'm going to tell you something and then you're going to think about it for a few days before you respond to me. And it is so the best thing to do because she'll tell you something and it will actually really upset you. And you think, oh, no, that was my best idea ever. But then you think about it for a few days and you're like, OK, yeah, I kind of get it. It's probably not the best idea. <laughs> and she obviously helps you come up with more. So what she did is she said, right, well, we'll brainstorm this together. Right. You come up with like five, six, seven ideas, you know, and just like write a line for each. And, um, and then we'll chat about what might work. So um, obviously I knew I wanted it to be fairy tale inspired again. So I kind of got out all my fairy tale books and looked at all the stories that inspired me and came up with like a whole bunch of ideas and talked about them with Gemma and, um, and also Rebecca because it was going to be an Osborne book. And so Rebecca obviously had a good say in it and everyone kind of agreed that um, the best idea was... Um, the Girl Who Speaks Fair. It had a different title then. And I, I can't actually tell you the first title because it gives away, it was a spoiler title. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, you could probably guess it yourself because it was kind of like The House with Chicken Legs. Oh, uh, can, I, yeah. can I give you my suggestions after we finish the live? Yeah, yeah, then, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 So, anyway, basically, there's like, there's a Russian fairy story called Ivanko the Bear's Son. And it's about a, um, a, a, a mother and a, a mother a woman goes off and spends some time with a bear and they have a child and Ivanko is a bear from the waist down and a human from the waist up and then it proceeds to be a kind of one of those fairy stories where Ivanko is kind of like the lovable fool that isn't too smart but he, he gets away with lots of stuff and it wasn't actually the story that inspired me but that imagery of a character who's part bear and part human is quite powerful imagery and I I thought I'm going to work with this and I researched lots of other fairy tales that have kind of shape-shifting bears or bear characters and and I thought I like this idea of you know like a proper fairy tale with talking animals and a bearish human and you know and um, and a forest you know and, and just like that proper fairy tale thing and um, it wasn't planned at first but you know how um bear has like the interwoven folk tales yes you know, that, yes yeah, so that came out in a, a later draft, but in between, will it focus on it? The, the pages with the border, yeah, they're like interwoven. I think there's 12 altogether, little short folk tales that stand alone, but they're also um, interwoven with the main narrative and it took ages to get that right. But I, I'm, that's why I'm so proud of it now, because I love that. And I think part of that was because I'd researched so many fairy tales trying to come up with an idea for book two, they all ended up being in there, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, one idea, but I still had all the other folk tales in my head. So, like, loads of what I had been researching when trying to come up with an idea for book two all ended up in there anyway, you know, with these interwoven fairy stories. And that was really tricky to write. And it was actually Gemma's idea to take them out separately. At first, they were woven. They were just in the main narrative. So a character would just tell a story you know and um, and Gemma said why don't you try taking them out and having them separate you know and, and it took a I experimented with that and Gemma helped me and my editor helped me and it took a lot of work and but it really I love stuff like that because it develops your skill as a writer and that I'm, I'm so proud of it now because you know it took a lot of drafts and it was it was a mess for a long time but <laughs> honestly I'm so proud of it now for that I love it you should it really be Jade said this was my favorite thing about Bear and Maura I love the stories and the stories like I feel like I didn't get to see any drafts or anything like that I can only speak on the the version that I've been presented with which was um the the finished product um oh, yeah. it's, perfect. it's perfect it's beautiful oh and the and the proof with the stamp I have to shout out Stevie for that Stevie Hop Hopwood Stevie Hopwood my um marketing lady is an absolute genius that is she hand stamped 900 700 hundreds and hundreds she hand stamped all those covers you know she always comes up with incredible ideas she's she's brilliant brilliant woman yeah, yeah and she's been so helpful and nice to me about getting my hands on anything sophie anderson related really so 
Thank you, Stevie, if you're watching. Thank you so much. I know. Uh, me too. <laughs> uh, so the characters in this one again is so unique from like with the house with chicken eggs as well. And what I love about your stories are, I mean, there's two. There's the um, the protagonist and the sidekick kind of character. So firstly, with the protagonist, we have mm -hmm. Yanka, who follows you know Marinka from the first one as a really strong like you know female um, lead and character, which I feel like. I think maybe I'm trying to cast my mind back to what I read as a child and what I was growing up with. And there wasn't really too much like female leading ladies in middle grade. Um, so like, was it hard to follow Marinka as a, as a strong protagonist and like as somebody who a lot of children can look up to? Because I feel like, yeah, Marinka, Yanka, and even, um, do you pronounce it Ol Olia? From the third one, I, yeah, I, I, I call it Alia, but um, okay. I might call it Olia because it because her name's Magnolia. So, but I call uh, her Alia. I, I'm not. You, you can pronounce her name however you want. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll say Alia because I'll the Alia. the creator. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um. So, was it hard to follow Mar Marinka? Like, was Yanka a really hard character to develop? Um. She took she took longer to develop actually um, than M Marinka fell in. She's one of those, sometimes like you say you get a character that just comes fully formed and Marinka I think very much was probably because she was quite based on my daughter at that time. So I had quite a clear idea of who Marinka was. Um, Yanka did take some more getting right. You know, I did. When you said about a strong female MC, I, re I remember back actually. I was driving. You know, I say about write writing happens everywhere. I was my husband was driving me somewhere it was by the side of a lake beautiful lake I remember exactly where it was and I was just thinking in my head what is Yanka going to be like and um, my first idea what I really wanted was I wanted a big strong girl because you know quite often the girls are small and dainty and even when they're strong they're quite often small and fast and and dainty I thought no I want a great big girl you know like a big and at first she was actually a lot more clumsy as well I, I wanted that to be a characteristic I thought I want a great big clumsy girl you know because that's what I was at one point I was quite small but then I had a massive growth spurt I was really tall I'm really tall now and I'm quite clumsy I thought let's do this let's just have a great big girl who's really strong as well you know I wanted her to be strong as a bear that was the thing because Yanka has bearish characteristics she's called Yanka the bear because she's so big because she's so strong she can lift old logs and carry them around and I thought that's what I want a big strong character and um that kind of stuck but you know a lot of the other stuff took several drafts to, to come through you know um because I think and initially she was quite um she is quite a shy character at first and initially she was quite down on herself as well and Gemma said she was perhaps too down on herself because this is a at the point you're too down on yourself nobody wants to listen or read about you you have to make a likable character that someone wants to read about so um getting that balance of her being shy and lacking in a bit of confidence but not being too pessimistic you know so she did take more work basically yeah but, um, uh, I out in the end <laughs> Diane said um I love Yanka's insecurities about her size and that she grows into her body confidence that is as you said with the first book death being a universal theme I feel like in the Killer Speaks Bear, this is more of like a self-acceptance kind of theme running yeah, throughout yeah. as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I didn't plan and I didn't know where it was going, but I think in my heart I knew that's what I wanted. I wanted her to start off being insecure and unsure about herself, but I wanted her to learn to love herself. And even though I didn't really know the details of how the book would end, I knew that I wanted that to be the message whether I wanted that to be her emotional arc, her character arc, that she just grew to accept herself and love herself. Because that's so much about what middle grade, what growing up is about, is, you know, whoever you are, you just need to embrace who you are and accept it and love it. And so I just wanted that feeling, you know. And so she sets off with kind of, I want to change myself. You know, but I just want to say that's that's the want and the need thing, isn't it? You know, she, yeah. she wants to change herself, but she she needs to learn just to accept herself as she is and not change because she's beautiful as she is, you know, as we all are. I This is what I love about my children's books, actually. And yeah. um, I'm going to talk about mouse, Mousetrap first, but that did tie in nicely with a question after that, because I love Mousetrap so much. He's an absolute st scene stealer. So what was it like writing writing Mousetrap? And like, how did you have? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, he just he... came in fully formed. 
and he's still he's here you know like he's one of those characters who stayed with me and every so often he talks in my ear he's like Sophie when am I going to get my own series you know the incredible adventures <laughs> the brave I need like a whole series <laughs> You know, we need it now yeah yeah, yeah we need maybe it. i'd like to he's you know he is like a proper he, he doesn't feel like my creation he feels like mousetrap just came to see me and yeah. sometimes i still you know he's based yeah. on a real week you know he's really? based on it yeah in the old house we had um they were always a really, really old house we used to live in this one's really old too we, we saw a weasel out the back not long ago i was like he's followed us but um <laughs> but there i used to, used to we'd heard mice under the floorboards and then, um, and then we started hearing like a bigger creature, you know, and and then like a like a death squeal, <laughs> like, oh and it was God. a weasel, but, you know. And then we used to, and then we'd see it sometimes, you know. So there was a weasel that basically used to come in from outside because it's a it's, um, the houses we've been a stone built, so they can come through the little gaps in the stones and hunt for mice under the floorboards. And oh so mousetrap was totally based on our weasel, you know. I love that. And I, as you said, like a series for Mousetrap, maybe a world book day book or a, a novella, yeah. or, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole series if you can't do that, yeah. but just anything yeah, with Mousetrap. Yeah. I would, of all the things, I, I do like to move on, but of all the things, yeah. if I were to backtrack, it might well be Mousetrap that calls me back. Yeah, because he does still talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've done this yet. <laughs> that is like so apt for Mousetrap in the world. It does sound like <laughs> right. uh, I so... the main name the star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not about the anchor at all. It's the 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 um the one of the great things about it, but also uh, Diana also asked oops, wrong one, sorry. Um the side <laughs> characters here heard are just beautifully supportive. Uh, did you model their personalities on anyone? But also, yeah, yeah. listen to Mousetrap. <laughs> yeah, I probably did. All, all my characters, I think all writers must do this. You do always, you know, model your characters on um, people you know, or perhaps a combination of people you know, definitely. You know, so there's nobody that springs to mind in particular. Yanka is actually my husband, um, massively. Oh. Yeah, for lots of reasons. I won't talk too much, but yeah, but Yanka is modelled on my husband. Um, but like I said I before, Marinka is modelled on my daughter my eldest daughter um, and possibly me when I was at that age too um I think I used to be a teacher for a while and um I quite often channel I remember a lot of the kids that I taught I was secondary teacher and um quite a lot of them um sneak into my book like Benjamin in the house particularly is the boy that I taught and I was just thinking about the elk Yuri and and he's a, a girl actually that I taught so yeah I do I do borrow bits of people yeah Definitely. It's hard not to. It's like influences yeah. everywhere. Perhaps yeah. that's where you get your inspiration from. Yeah. Uh, well, before I move on to the Castle of Tangle Magic, because wait, like I've, I'm sorry, I've taken so much of your time already. <laughs> uh, the last time, I don't know what time it is. Yeah. Uh, the, the last question for Gilder Speaks Bear because it won the People's Choice Award at the Wales Book of the Year and that is a huge feat because it's, isn't it the first time a children's book has, has won the award? Yeah, well it's the first time there's been a children's category so this award's so, been going on for years and years and years and they haven't had a children's category why wouldn't they do that? So they've had like a you know a fiction category, a non-fiction category a poetry category it's the first time they've had a children's category so. And the girl who speaks bear won, which is fantastic. Yeah. And it won what's called the people's vote. So in the people's vote, all the books were up for that. So the children's book beat all the, you know, the grown-up books. You know, so that was kind of cool. And that's very much down to children's book Twitter. So I have to thank all the children's book Twitter people who voted really for that. You know, so. the children's book awesome. Twitter. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. lovely community to be part of. Yeah. And they, you know, they showed their support for a children's book and the children's book won. And it really it really validated that category then, you know. It showed that, you know, people love children's books, you know, and would take the time to vote for them and read them. And, yeah, good. Yeah, because I was going to say, definitely children's books need more recognition in, well, in awards industries or just like kind of even doing book blogging and book posts and all of that. It does seem like children's books get, glazed over a lot yeah, that's like I saying about this you know people assuming they're for children when they're for everyone you know I truly believe they are for everyone you know loads you know I probably get an equal amount of kind of fan messaging from adults as from children you know they, you know and, and you know not just like 
yeah like proper deep conversations about how my books have meant something to them you know as an adult you know so you know and it's not just my books you know it's um children's books have you know they, they can be deeply philosophical and you know intelligent and well crafted and you know it's not like they're dumbed down for children if anything they're um they're distilled to to really appeal to you know those universal human things you know and they have to be pacey and they you know because otherwise children won't read them and you know they have to they, they, they are the best books i'm just gonna say it you books. children's authors have such a hard job i should say everybody authors um you have a hard job because you do have to yeah as you said like distill it for like a, a younger audience but also it is for everyone you know it's not just like you're writing for one specific age yeah. group it is going to be read by everyone i'm writing for I've saying this before to someone you, you know, I'm, I'm writing for the adult who's reading to the child I'm, re I'm writing for the child i'm writing for the adult the child will grow into i'm writing for the child inside the adult i'm writing for a family to enjoy together i'm writing for children's books quite often get reread as children grow up and grow older so you know you need to have layers in them that will appeal to readers at different ages so that they can reread it and get something out of it again because children quite often love to reread books and you know so they're, they're designed to be reread you know which adult books often aren't you know I, I read quite I read, I, I read a few adult books but I will read them and then probably charity shop them but you know my favorite children's books I keep because I know that I will reread them or my children will reread them and you know yeah, because they I agree. <laughs> yeah. I agree so much um well then uh don't worry there's not going to be any spoilers for the castle of tangled magic which is what we're going to be talking about now so you don't uh nobody needs to worry about any slip of the toes um on, <laughs> although I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to get Sophie to say anything about book number four, but you know, that's a work in progress. Um, but yeah, uh, the release day was literally um, eight days ago. So it was released last week. How did you spend your release day? Was it a celebration or was it really different to what you're used to because of everything that's gone on? Yeah, it was, it was different because, um because there was no external events this time. It was, you know, I had a little celebration. To be honest, it, um, it didn't, that was the release day but it had been sneaking out of bookshops for a few weeks before so i'd, I'd been getting you know seeing lots of pictures on twitter of it and um getting people saying that they loved it for weeks before so it didn't feel as special for a couple of reasons because it i already had a lot of feedback and um and because there was no big external event i think that the most special day actually about a new book is when you get the first copy turn up in the post I think that's the really, you know, when you're like, oh, I've got a real book and it's a hello and a goodbye. It's hello to a proper book and goodbye because I'm not working on you anymore now. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> you're done. Bye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> next, <laughs> next story, you know. So, yeah, so that was that, a special day. When it turned up in the post, that was the special day. Good. Really. I will. Jade said my fav uh, favorite so far from you, Sophie, oh, and I agree. Thank you. I do. Oh, thank you. I, I have a because I use Copile. It's a rating system where mm -hmm. it rates books kind of out of ten, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's like out of all of your books so far, it has like the highest rating because it just has everything in it. It has the adventure, it has the characters, it has the plot, it has the setting, it has everything. So Wicked. that's good. That's so good. Because there's always that, like you say, because you know, people have loved the first two, so there's always this, oh, they might not like this one as much. So it's it's wonderful to hear. Phew. Good. And that's what this live show is all about. It's to inflate your ego. So can it's you telling. <laughs> <laughs> can you um let the readers know what they can expect from the the castle of title magic without any spoilers? Like oh. I mean, I said everything. I said everything, but can you narrow yeah. it down for us? <laughs> um, okay, so it's um, so it's my it's a magical portal adventure. Yeah, so it has you know like a doorway to another world. So it's one of those books where I got to invent a whole world and fill it with like all 
the amazing fairy tale characters and motifs and spirits from Slavic mythology and just loads of stuff I loved and saying earlier about my children I remember sitting at the table and saying hey kids what do you want to put in this magical world I'm creating and they just threw ideas in and I just created this massive magical world for um, Olia to travel into and um so it's full, it's probably the most imaginative book maybe in a way because it's so full because that the entire world is like a magical world, you know, that most of the, the book is set in. Obviously there's the real world, it goes into the magical world and a massive adventure, you know, which is, um, you know, it, yeah, it's just fun. It's just pure fun. And then the themes obviously are, are like family and love and kindness and community. And it was nice because it was also the first book I'd written both the house of chicken legs and the girl who speaks bear you had a single parent and a single child and i thought right this one i'm going to have like a bigger family because i have a big family you know so i didn't make it that big but i had two parents had a grandmother had ollie and she has a little sister and so i thought right i'm going to do like a bigger family this time and have like that bigger family dynamic and i'm also middle grade you quite often like kick the parents out of the way don't you so the kids can <laughs> adventure and obviously ollie goes into the magical world alone but when she comes out and there's the big finale and stuff, her, her parents are there and it's not like it's a secret from her parents. So her parents get to be involved in the magical world as well. So, and I wanted that too. I thought I'm not just going to have parents shoved to the side. I'm going to have an adventure with parents and a sibling and a grandmother and, you know, have all that. So there's quite a family thing and lots of imagination and lots of fun. Hopefully, It's another like fun one. I yeah I would agree with that and especially to do with the family and stuff I think as soon as I finished reading it I think I sent you a message like oh my god because something happens which I won't spoil for anyone but something happens or something is revealed and I it blew my mind it literally and I think everybody who read this so like Jade and CC, I love the Castle Tongue of Magic it was amazing again I love the Castle Tongue of Magic it's the first book of yours I have read really looking forward to the map we can all agree at least like don't say anything in the comments anyone about what it is that i'm, I'm yeah, referring to yeah secret. but it, it yeah it's a secret but yeah it blew jade's mind as well it's literal oh my god i loved it so much so uh <laughs> and what so would you say sophia then um and you don't have to be modest or anything like would you say that for personally for you this would be your favorite as you said it's the most imaginative imaginative yeah. one you've done but like is like your experience writing it and everything would you say it's been your your favorite one to to work on um I think I think um in terms of as I write more books I want to get better obviously mm. so in terms of like technical writing skills I do aim to improve and I would like to think that with each book I've improved and I I'm always driving to improve in terms of you know technical writing skills in terms of story um, I find it really difficult to choose a favourite because although there's similarities between them, they're also very different. Like we say, Marinka, House of Chicken Eggs will always have a place in my heart because it has that death theme and it's very personal. The Girl Who Speaks Bear, again, I'm, I, I, I love fairy tales and to me that's my ultimate fairy tale book. And then I love The Castle of Tangled Magic because it's based on a Pushkin poem and I thought it was the most kind of silly and bonkers idea to try to base a book on a like 100-year-old like Russian poem, <laughs> which is if anyone's read um, like Ruslan and Ludmilla, which is this Russian poem, that's what the book is based on, and it's a bonkers poem. And um, I had this idea to write a book out of it, and I'm kind of really proud that I did because it was it's kind of like a silly idea, but uh, you know I hope it works. But, um, but anyway, so as far as the story goes, I I love all the stories, um, and I couldn't choose a favorite. It's like choosing a favorite. But, you know, I love them all for different reasons. But in terms of technical writing, definitely, I I hope I've improved with each book, and I hope to keep improving on that front. You know, maybe hopefully. Well, yeah, I I know a lot of authors said like their most recent book that they've read they feel like is their favorite because they have yeah. learned so much from yeah. just the process over the time. So I totally understand that actually. Yeah. And I think you have to I've always my favorite is the one I'm working on now. So what I'm working on now is my favorite now. And I think it has to be, you know, you have to keep thinking this is going to be my best. You have to keep driving to improve, you know. So always at every stage, the one I have been working on has always been my favorite, you know. And then, like I say, it comes in the post and it is like a goodbye. It's like, right, I'm not working on you anymore. You're done. I'm going to move on. And the next one's going to be even better and bigger. And, 
you just do that to keep your head in it the game yeah yeah um I, there were some questions at the very start which i can't get to anymore because there's been that many comments it won't let me go all the way to the start again anymore um but uh there was a question about how the idea of castle mila uh, do you pronounce it mila or yeah. mila yeah mila mila because the the poem was called ruslan and the miller um uh, the, the the miller come from Rosalind and Miller, but I, I say Miller just because that's how I pronounce that word. But like I say, I don't. Well, the regional variations of, of accents in Britain are vast, aren't they? So I, I don't mind how people pronounce these words. You know, oh, don't I know it? <laughs> the amount of people who say I pronounce things wrong in my videos, I'm a Geordie. I pronounce it's everything wrong. wrong. <laughs> you know, there is no, there is no right or wrong. I think just you know, enjoy the story. Yeah, I, I, I say, say the Castle Mila, but I, you know, I'm not yeah. going to. <laughs> well, good. We're, we're like twins, you and me, Sophie. Um, uh, so Castle Mila, like, how, did you? There was a question very early on. Um, which I can't get to anymore, but mm -hmm. it was about the inspiration behind it and like the idea for like Casemira because the imagery is gorgeous. Look at that. Look at that. That is beautiful. Wow. That's the inspiration for it. You see? Wow. That's called um, the Church of Transfiguration. And um, it's, um, it's a Russian church that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. It's, um, it's on a little island in Lake Onega. And it has 22 onion domes, I think. And you'll recognize this now from the Castle of Tangled Magic, but it was built without a single nail. All the pieces were built to slot together perfectly. And um, that, that's the inspiration. I saw pictures of the Church of Transfiguration and other, there are hundreds. Um, this book, this book. Oh. <laughs> Ooh. Architecture. Basically, like wooden churches in, in Russia. Um, it's weird actually because um, it was the poorer communities that couldn't afford a big fancy building, so they build wooden ones. And a lot of them have actually been they'd like um, when they have more money, they they tear them down and replace them or cover up, cover up the wood with metal. But I think these wooden ones are beautiful. And um, if you just start googling, you know, like wooden churches in Russia, you'll just be amazed. It's you know, so that I did loads of research, an unnecessary amount of research about um, architecture. Um, in 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 Russia, the, the wooden churches in particular, and so that inspired Castle Mila. And then the other inspiration was I was talking about um, Ruslan und Ludmilla, which this is the poem. It's it's a very long fairy tale in verse written by Alexander Pushkin, and um, lots of the characters from um, the Castle of Tangled Magic are borrowed from there it's almost like um i think of the castle of tangled magic as a sequel to this so ah. yeah. i'll have to read that and i was going to yeah. say actually sarah Sutherland has done a fantastic job of portraying mm. the castle of tangled magic like, you know castle mila and everything in it seriously like even like that illustration there yeah. it's just i love the look of it it's just so folk tailor like esque and Oh, I need to read that as well. I it's it's a that. very different read, obviously, to you know, but I, I think it's a beautiful read. And it's um it was it was a challenge to turn it into middle grade because it's quite old. Um it's riddled with um like sexism and stereotypes and and a few things happen that I you couldn't put in a middle grade book, but so it was a challenge to try I wanted to transport the magical, beautiful, wonderful things into the book and kind of leave behind the things that, you know. Not quite yeah. so, um, you know, uh, yeah, you just don't want to middle grade today. Well, and this is the book of transfiguration. <laughs> oh, you I transfigured did. it. <laughs> I did, I transfigured it. Indeed. I'll be interested to see if it, because obviously not this, um, not not lots of British people know about this, but apparently it's really huge in Russia. So I'm going to, I'm intrigued now to see if it gets translated into Russian and whether they love it or hate it, you know, because. I always feel, you know, when you borrow something that's very popular in another, like borrowing Baba Yaga, I was terrified that people would not be happy with my portrayal of Baba Yaga, you know, and I feel the same about Castle. I, I, I worry if people will not be happy that I borrowed Pushkin's characters. But Pushkin, I kind of justify it because Pushkin himself was a great borrower of folklore. He used to be inspired by folklore and rework it into his work. So, um, so he did it so I can do it. 
<laughs> I feel like folk tales and fairy tales belong to the people who listen to the stories, really. So I'm I'm with you on that one. Uh, yeah. Dion actually asked, um, did you have fun with the fantasy animals in Castle Tangle Magic? Because we do get, like, I love Koshka. Like, yeah. oh, I, she's, like, incredible. I love her. Um, so, like, I mean, again, no spoilers or anything, but, like, did you have fun? As I said before as well, mm -hmm. Companions, you write so well, like Mousetrap, and, like, mm -hmm. you kind of carried that on through the Castle of Tangled Magic as well. So, yeah, um, as Dion asked, um, did you have fun with the fantasy animals? In, I in did. Castle I love them. Lots of them are from Russian folklore, but, it, like Dion said, I, um, I, I do sit with my family, and I did borrow their ideas, and Alec has always got, um, ideas to share and I'm sure if you he wanted me to put I can't, it's called an almasty which is a Russian yeti he wanted me to put in but I, I couldn't really find space for it sadly but he did give me um, some characters that went I think he gave there there's a weasel um, in in the, that breathes fire it's not a big character so I, I'm, I don't think that's too big a spoiler because it's just a small character but I think Alec gave me the fire breathing weasel so, yeah, they all had a little say. Like I say, we're in the magical world, they all had a little say. They all got to put something in. They're, they're, they're singing mushrooms and my husband's and, you know, there's something in there of all of us, which is quite nice, I think, you know. <laughs> I love that. And uh, Jade, actually, I'll, I'll intersect a question from Jade here, actually, as well, because um, Jade's a massive fan of Russian and Slavic folklore and fairy tale retellings. Hasn't actually read any originals, so would you recommend right. starting with any as, like, as with his entries? Like into that. I would. I'm going to get a book. Okay, hold on. Okay, I'm just going to show the people my dance moves. And it's this. It's beautiful. Ha -ha, there we here go. we go. Right. So if I put this here, Ooh. this is called, this is probably the best, as an adult, and these, not all of them are suitable for children, although I have read most of them to my children, but they're like the older two who are teenagers. It's called Russian Magic Tales from Pushkin to Platonov. All right, and it's a penguin classic, and um, that contains loads. And um, I would probably say that's a good place to start if you want to read lots of the originals and you want to read. Um, it has a range of tellers. You know how, um, obviously, fairy and folk tales are oral tales, but you have the collectors, like the Brothers Grimm collected them. So this yeah. has a range of the collectors, all right, because there's a, a few different collectors of Russian fairy tales, and it kind of arranges it chronologically. And you get that it has a little bio of the collectors. It's really, really good. That would be like him. Um, and then if you want something for children specifically, I would recommend James Mayhew's book. He has a book that's published with Graphic that's called, I think it's called Russian Fairy Tales. Hold on, sorry. I'll dance again. <laughs> I would sing the song Sophie sang before, but I don't oh, know. Koshka's Tales, of course it is. I borrowed hey. Koshka's Tales. Oshka's tale. So this one's suitable for children. And um that's yeah, yeah, read that. I love James. Oh. James is brilliant. I might have to read these myself as well, actually. It's a really good question. Uh Jade's just ordered it. <laughs> so that was quick. <laughs> ah, excellent. <laughs> Good. You you could be a bookseller. You could literally be a bookseller. I, could. I love books. I've always got I could, you know, I could recommend them all day. I could just we could just talk about other people's books. <laughs> Well, I know I want. Well, I still want to talk about Castle Tangle Magic, so I'll ask a couple more questions, okay. and then I'll open it up to the viewers. Um, right. But there's a, there's an added bonus in the Waterstones edition, which I I try and plug Waterstones as much as possible yeah. over something like Amazon because Amazon don't get a lot of the Waterstones exclusive, whether it's spread edges know. or whether it's yeah, like or whether it's like a short story or added story. So you've added a, a bonus short story. Like, how did you find writing that, and what is what is the short story and why do people need to buy it from Waterstones? I would, I would say to that, yeah. It was like, it's like a, an author goal ticked off to have a special edition. So, and um, so my editor said, oh, we're thinking of a Waterstones special edition. Would you like to write an extra chapter? Have you got any ideas? And I, I knew exactly what it was going to be because um, I'm trying to do this without giving a spoiler. But um, so in the big finale scene, there's a big finale scene and there's lots of wonderful things to be seen in that. But um, um, Ollie has a baby sister and a grandmother. And because the big finale scene also has an element of peril, I didn't want to put the baby and the grandmother in the peril. I thought that would be too much. So they're off somewhere safe while there's the perilous, exciting scene. But that did mean that the baby sister and the grandmother missed out on seeing 
some of the wonderful aspects of that um you know final scene so um i think there's at some point you know in, in the the main book Ollie actually says oh in the future i'm going to take my baby sister to come and see these amazing things yeah um, and that kind of, you know, because I felt bad that she didn't see it. And so when Rebecca, my editor, said, you know, do you want to write another chapter? I knew exactly straight away. It was like, yes, it's going to be after the book. And it's going to be when Olia takes her baby sister and her grandmother to see these things that they missed out on in the book. And Rebecca straight away was like, yeah, 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 yeah. You have to do that. It was like tying up a loose end that, you know, I didn't really know was a loose end, if you see what I mean, because I was happy with the book as it was, obviously. But. But getting to write that scene and actually, you know, playing it out was it was really wonderful. It was a lovely, lovely thing to write. And actually, the book ended up being bigger because Rebecca said um, the short the short story, the extra chapter, has to be like twelve hundred words, and it's not. I think it's like double that. And I said to Rebecca, you know, shall I cut it down? And she said, no, let's keep it. But they actually made the whole book bigger. You know, because I think there's only so many. I don't know the ins and outs of publishing, but you have to have so many pages added so as well as the short short story they added some extra content and stuff like that and the whole book got bigger so the Waterstones edition is actually a bigger book it has more pages um yeah you're such a diva (laughs) (laughs) I I remember saying oh we have to run it by sales and we have to check the costing will work and you know but I would yeah it was good I was I was pleased it's a lovely story yeah it it all worked out in the end yeah um so the last question for Castle Tango Magic, and then if any viewer questions has any questions, I will ask, and I'll try and go back through. So there's been quite a lot of comments. So I think a lot of them have gotten lost in in the comments, but I'll try and get, I try and get to them. Um, but the last question on Castle Tango Magic: Is there any news on a North American release yet? I know a lot of my viewers are North American. Any news on a, a release there yet? It is. It is definitely coming out. Um, it's going to come out with Scholastic again. And I have the same editor, Mallory, again. So um, I don't know for sure about the cover, but I have everything crossed. It will be um, Red Nose Studio and Chris again. But it is coming out in fall 2021. So I have Chris's covers. So, um, so these are both Scholastic editions. These are American editions. So it, it's with Scholastic again. It's with Mallory again, the same editor. Um, so I don't want to, you know... I don't want to jinx anything. I, I hope it's Chris again, but I, I haven't heard anything. I've signed the contract. It's all a done deal. It is coming out, but I haven't had any of the um, edits. But it gets edited um, into American language, you know, and mm-hmm. and always Mallory always finds a, a few little other things to change. And and I haven't had the cover yet. But yeah, for uh, like fall 2021. Yes, it is coming out. Yeah, I think it's already yeah. on the US already. So, you know, but not, not for sale. But, you know, I think you can see it there. So, you know, it's coming. Good. I know a lot of my viewers will be really happy with that, especially yeah. since when I um, said, like, if you can read a Sophie Anderson book, Bob Leverthon, you get double the points. So I feel like a lot of people are now trying to get their their hands on on at least the Castle Town Magic. So oh, uh, Ravenous Reads does. I don't know. Do they have seller? Do they? <laughs> They can, they do, but it costs a bit more. And it because I well, Europe, I've sent a couple oh, of books Europe. to America, oh, yeah, no, yeah. Europe, maybe might not be so bad to Europe, maybe mm. not. But I, I'm not too sure. But if you do want a Waterstones copy, seriously, like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, I can, I, I'll do a giveaway, I'll do a giveaway. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, also ordering a Waterstones copy right now. So Sophie, I mean, obviously you said that you are working on something next, but you can't say what it is. Obviously, like that's. But like, can I you give like? Because I want to actually, because I love it, and I think it's the best thing in the world right now. But I, I can't obviously, because it is early days, and so lots might change. You know, but it is. I, I'm allowed to say that it, it will be published because um, I think they announced that it was a two book deal with Castle or with Usborne. So it is publishing with Usborne. Um, not until 20. What did I say to you? It's not next year, it's the year after. So 2022, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Spring 2022. So it is a bit of a wait, but it's going to be amazing. <laughs> I, I can, I already know it is. And that's why I'm so like, I want to know about it. Yeah. Uh, gosh, you authors, honestly. Um, <laughs> it's best not to because if I tell you and then it all changes you'll be like oh, why did she say thingy was in it and it's not that at all 
you know, because yeah. it can, it, it can all change in edits, but I am very excited about it. And you know, I can say it's, definitely, it's another middle grade. It's also inspired by um, Slavic folklore and, um, yeah, it's it's really imaginative. At the moment, it has themes of power, you know, but um, obviously that might change. But so there's kind of like, there's like politics in it, I suppose, in a way. It's got like the most diverse cast of characters I've written um, ever, which I'm quite proud of. I really wanted to do that because I haven't been great writing them, a diverse cast of characters so far. So, you know, so I will say that, I think. And I hope all that sticks. But, you know, that's kind of as much as I can say, probably. Okay, I like you. <laughs> um, do you have any reading recommendations, um, or any always. of your all-time favorites that always, you would like to? Always. Oh my god! So a childhood favorite. Oh, yeah. I'm a huge Moomins fan. Can you see my Moomin? Where's he gone? But it's really. Can you see him? I, I think I so. Ah, Moomin. So yeah, I'm a huge. Yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge Tuve Janssen fan, just full stop. I love her adult books as well. But um, the, the Moomin books are some of the first books that got me reading. And I don't reread many books because there's always new books to read. But um, I will reread um, at least one Moomin's book every year. I love them. I think they're beautiful, beautiful books. Um, nobody writes like Tuve Janssen. She's amazing. They're deeply philosophical, really intelligent, you know, and also fun and full of whimsy and humour. And if you haven't read a Moomin's book, you should try. Definitely. So, you're, you yeah, you're going to hate me. Oh, I love that book. Yeah. Have you not read Moomin's? I haven't read Moomin's, no. Right, you need me. to try one. Try one. No, I don't hate you. It's like because you've got like all that to discover now, haven't you? You know, start with anyone. Start with anyone and just just try one. You know, just try one. I and will. I, you will love them. They're beautiful. They are like, comfort, you. comfort reads. You know, uh, they're just, yeah. they're so comforting, especially, I know lots of people, I read them to my children, my children love them, I love them, they're some of the few, yeah, just read them, just try one. So yeah, that's, that's another one, slightly I newer. Love that one. You know, Grace Lynn, Where the Mountain Meets the Moon, it's slightly newer. I read this as an adult, and um, but it's, it's one of my all-time favourite books. It's a little bit like Bear, I realised afterwards, in that it has the interwoven fairy stories, but it's from um, like a Chinese culture, isn't it? And um, it also has a strong female protagonist and it also uses loads of folklore, uh, folkloric elements, but takes away the kind of gender stereotypes and things that we don't like about fairy tales and folklore. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And my I last agree. One, it's brilliant, isn't it? Absolutely spot on. And my, my last rec is this. Have you read this yet, Gavin? I have it, I've started it. Um, I have it. It's somewhere over there. It's in my, I've, yeah, I've, I've got it right there. I want to grab it just to prove that I got it. Yeah, he needs to read this. Yes, he oh, needs to read this. It is, it is MG, but it's kind of upper MG, I would say. But I, I don't want to say anything about it because I will not do it justice, but I believe everyone should read this. It's um, amazing, basically. Yeah. That is my yeah. three recommendations for you. Read well, one them all. Of my I will. One of my favorite booktubers is Cody from Cody's Book Corner. And she read mm. this a couple of weeks back, maybe a, a month or two ago. And she said it's like one of her all-time favorites now. I, I trust, I trust. It is startlingly original in every regard. The writing, the story, the world that's created. It's, it's again, it's deeply philosophical, but it's fun. And yeah, just read it. It's, it's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. I will. Also, um, I've read the second book um, that Grace Lynn did, Story River of the Sky, another fantastic book, but I have yet to read yes, um, this one. Yeah, I've got all three on my shelf. I haven't read that one yet. I, I, I need... haven't read it yet. Believe-a-thon. We'll read it for Believe-a-thon. That's, <laughs> That's a good plan. She's a, a brilliant writer. Brilliant. Oh, she yeah. is. Absolutely. Um, so Dion asked, um, I could see a TV series about House of Chicken Legs. Any plans to bring it to the screen? Wouldn't that be the dream? Wouldn't that be the dream? Do you know what? Maybe not, right? Everyone always asks this. And um, when you actually start to think about how many um, TV series and films that you've watched based on books and you haven't liked what they've done with them, it's the chance of it being the dream is actually not that. You know, it could be stuffed up really quite badly, couldn't it? You know, there's a couple of um, companies that I would trust with it. 
But um, do you know what? Um, I, I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to talk about it, but the House for Chicken Legs has done the rounds. So a lot of people have thought about producing it. And we even thought, like, you know, that it might happen with a couple of companies at one point. I, I don't know the proper terminology, but a company can kind of ask for exclusive rights to think about it for a while and do like a little bit of script development and start to think how they produce it and you know really decide about it and a couple of um you know uh, companies did that and so we thought it might go but it, it, everything fell through and so um i don't think that will ever happen now because um, my film agent has taken it round everyone and so it's had a lot of rejections there um there is something I'm not allowed to tell you that's exciting that's happening with it, but it's not film and it's not TV. So, you know, I don't even forget because, I'd, you know, but there's, you know, so no. And and you know what? I'm like I say, I'm actually happy with that. If it was someone like Leica, then I'd love it. Or if um, Chris, who does the American covers, actually wanted to move into to making stop mo, I'd love him to do it. You know, I, I would like it as a stop mo. Um, anything yeah. else I, I would be wary of it could be done really well but I, I would be upset if it wasn't done well and there's always that risk I think with them um, with movie and and tv deals so you know yeah I'm so I'm I, not yeah <laughs> yeah I get that and like I would be incredible for it I, I one of my favorite films is Kubo and the Two Strings Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. same here same here yeah, I, I would let them do it and I'd let them change it and do what they want. You know, like I was saying about letting the illustrators do their thing. If I I would let a really good animation studio like that just run with it and do their thing. But, you know, but um, yeah, some of the companies, you know, you, you, I, I'm not sure that, you know, yeah, you know, so I don't mind. Yeah, so probably not. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I totally get that. Um, would you ever do, because the audio books, are they, have, they haven't had audio books yet, have they? They haven't, but there are plans to. I'm not sure what yeah. I meant to say, but I, you know, I think I don't think I'm going. There, there, there are plans. Osborne have the audio rights, and I believe that something will happen soon with that. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So they're not out yet, but I, I think we'll we'll hear something about that before too long. Yeah, I think perhaps COVID slowed that down because I I thought it was happening a bit quicker, and I think perhaps COVID kind of hit that one a bit for now. Uh, I because I know like when I re like to reread books I like to mm -hmm. try and do the audio experience as well because uh, oh. like if I've already read it physically and I say with the illustrations and then I like to listen to the audiobook and read physically at the same time uh, just oh. as a different kind of reading experience so I would love to reread House and Girl and with the audiobook as well it would just be oh, it would just I add to it well. yeah I'm not because I'm not sure when but I think you will get that chance at some point yeah before too I will at them. I will at Osborne and say, I can't yeah. wait for these audiobooks. Please bring them ASAP. Oh, they're still not in the office a lot. So, you know, I think that's why I, I don't, I haven't nagged about anything. I, I, it is in the works, I think, though. So, yeah, when the world's safer, they'll, they'll appear one day. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good job that I'm not like an Osborne author because I'm a nag. I like to <laughs> nag people. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm terrible at that. But uh, anyway, we've been nearly talking for two hours now. So I'm. This is the long. Yeah, this is the longest interview I've done. Okay. Uh, and I. People are still watching. <laughs> they yeah. are just falling asleep at their screen. <laughs> no, they love you, Sophie, and I love you as well. So thank you so so much for doing this. Like, oh, you've made my night. You've made my. Night. Thank you so much for being on my channel. It's been an honor. It has thank been an honor. Me. It's been an honor to be here. Absolutely. Oh. I'm glad. Well, yes, everybody, please do buy The Castle of Tangled Magic. It is yes. brand new. I might please put a sign under a pile of other books. Then. Buy the Moomins. <laughs> <laughs> buy the Moomins. I will. I will start my first one. I promise. That one. That's um, the one. If you, if, you need, if you need a reminder of this beautiful cover, then that's it there. But yes, please do buy it. it there is an exclusive edition at Waterstones. Yeah. And yeah all of the uh links for sophie's website um actually before we go uh as well there is a read-along for the castle of yeah, Magic. I mean, my publicist said to talk about that <laughs> yes so yeah. i do want to briefly mention that actually before we do yeah. move on there is a read-along for the castle of Magic. Yeah. basically if you go to my website 
you'll see like a read along tab and that has links to like videos that I produce and they're only short. I think none of them are more than four minutes long. But um, um, this is the brainchild of Stevie again with the stamping. She's brilliant. So basically she picked six parts of the book and um, there's a downloadable resource pack which has extracts. And then they link to like a little video where I talk about um, that extract and what inspired it or, you know, just so everyone gets like a deeper insight into the writing process of that bit. And then it links to um, an activity that you can do. And there's loads of really cool prizes to win as well. So like the first activity is to produce like a patchwork blanket. So it doesn't have, to, you know, you can make it out of paper. It could just be a picture. You can make it out of anything you want and you post the picture on Twitter and you can win like these little fabric patches for the cast of Tangled Magic that are so cute. And, uh, and there's little standees to win and, um, and like loads of cool stuff. And there's six activities, six videos, six extracts. They're all on YouTube. They're on my YouTube channel as well. So, and like I said, they're just short videos, but um, I, I think they're quite cool. I think it was, you know, it was good fun to do. Yeah. I love them. I love them. They are like little short videos, but they're so like, in, well, not like, I was as I was watching them, they added more to the experience of certain yeah. things that happened. Like I remember the one about time and I just like seeing the little different locations that you are filming in as well. It was so good I the way you did that. In my house. Yeah. I go to my children's den because I thought, well, I'm gonna make six videos. I have to have a different background for each, otherwise I'll just be in here and everyone will be bored. So I tried to to move around our property. And uh, this so, yeah, it was that, fun. Yeah, that's why you should you, you should be a booktuber. That is like a booktubing thing. Like change up the background every now and then. Yeah. Honestly, you'd be amazing at it. Even though I was filming them on the same day. Did you notice that? <laughs> yes, yes. Incredible. Incredible. Uh so yes, please do check it out, everyone. I do have the links for Sophie's YouTube channel and website down below as well. Yeah. Go we'll follow yeah. Sophie on. Yeah. Yes. Follow on everything. Follow Sophie on everything, Twitter, Instagram, all of that. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, so thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I, yeah, everyone, I will see you in the next one, which actually I'll quickly say the next author interview is going to be with Elle McNichol. Awesome. Next awesome. Friday. Oh, that's so cool. I'm, gonna I'm watch so excited. Yeah, Yay. that's brilliant. What's the next one? Yay! Repping, repping all the middle grade authors. So that will be the next one. So yes, uh, thank you so much, Sophie. And any farewell words for the viewers? Thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the lovely, kind things you've said and your brilliant questions, and um, and for all your support. You know, it's it, it, I, you know, without readers, I just yeah. <laughs> thank you. Not I love you all. You're all brilliant. <laughs> oh well, thank you so much for tuning in, and yeah, we'll see you in the next one, guys. Bye.